So uh, welcome everyone. Uh, I, I should say good morning, good afternoon and good evening because uh, two of our guests uh, are connected from Canada and from Japan. So we do have different uh, time zones uh, today. Um, I should also say that if everyone is fine, uh, there is no objection, objection, I would record this meeting um, so that uh, for further colleagues, uh, uh, this could be uh, uh, a good training opportunity. Um, thanks a million to our very important guests today, na namely uh, Dennis Tangui and Daniele Forni. Uh, we are honored with your attendance. Um, and let me just spend uh, a few words uh, in introducing them uh, on their bio and on their expertise. So uh, just a few notes. Uh, Dennis is the executive director of EVO, uh, the Efficiency Evaluation Organization. He is a senior consultant with uh, 30 years experience, uh, providing advice and expertise to clients uh, in industry and governments in Canada and in other countries. As a consultant, uh, his mandates uh, included an extensive policy and market analysis of energy systems, uh, a green financing market study in the renewable energy sector, a blueprint for a building recommissioning investment fund, energy efficiency program design, as well as various government relation mandates. Uh, Dennis wrote and published several technical articles, research papers and position papers on energy, energy efficiency and market transformation strategies. Over the past 25 years, Dennis sat on the boards of many government technical committees, not for profit and non governmental organizations. Uh, moving to Daniele Forni. Daniele is Chief Technical Officer of the Italian Federation for the Rational Use of Energy, so called FIRE, uh, which is an organization promoting energy efficiency resource efficiency, renewable energy, and sustainable development. Within EVO, uh, Daniele co-chairs uh, the uh, Measurement and Verification Fundamentals Committee, and he was also a member of the Extended Training uh, Committee. Uh, Daniele works on national and international projects, especially those that focus on technical, economic, and legislative issues, and the use of energy efficient uh, technologies. Um, I would also like to uh, wish to add that uh, as ICE, uh, um, we are also honored to periodically talk to and cooperate with uh, Daniele and Fire, who are always, uh, uh, I would say, a precious uh, uh, reference or a kind of lighthouse uh, in terms of uh, um, energy policies, legislative aspects uh, and tools uh, concerning uh, all the energy matters uh, at national level. So again, uh, Daniele and Dennis, we appreciate your attendance today very much. Thanks again. Um, I don't know if Silvio uh, would like to uh, quickly share with Dennis and Daniele the main content, uh, purpose and partnership uh, of our stepping project, maybe? Yes, yes, Lisa, thank you very much. And uh, I, I, I have a wish for next year. Uh, my wish is that uh, I would be so lucky to be introduced by Lisa in a, in a workshop uh, next time because she's so amazing and uh, full of uh, nice words. I would like to receive some of them for me next time. Okay. This is my personal wish for next year. Maybe in, in stepping. <laughs> I am just joking. Thanks a lot for this introduction. This is the last, let's say, Capacity building workshop that um, of, of, of uh, STEMP Plus for the consortium. We came to the to the last part and maybe the most unexplored, I would say, by any of us. So we are moving in a um, in a field where any of us have, have to 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 learn. Uh, some words about stepping. Uh, Daniele has been involved in stepping uh, uh, some years ago for training purposes uh, as well. Uh, but in a way, just to, to, to let you know, we are now under the umbrella of Stepping Plus, which is the continuation of stepping. Uh, it's a, it's a project, European project co-founded by a program, Interreg 
the Interreg Med program. And um, let's say that uh, during uh, stepping, uh, some of the partners that are here uh, uh, implemented the project, I would say in a successful way, promoting uh, uh, energy performance contracts uh, uh, in, uh, in their own regions and um, delivering some, let's say, uh, transnational uh, guidelines, uh, recommendation, and so on. Uh, so we promoted uh, successfully investment using uh, a, a APC uh, in, um, in the building sector, in the public building sector. And the uh, Interact Med program asked us for a prolongation of the project, let's, let's call it like that, uh, with the aim of transferring. Uh, so not uh, really uh, focusing on new investments to be launched, uh, even though we uh, planned additional ones in, uh, in our follow-up, but also with the aim of transferring uh, the, the knowledge gained uh, uh, during the first part of the, uh, of the project. And so now we are here uh, with, with some former partners of, uh, of Stepping, uh, uh, which is us, Piemonte Region, uh, Modena, and um, over and run up. And we engaged additional uh, partners that uh, we are working with in this transferring proce uh, process. So again, we have partners from Italy, uh, from France, uh, uh, but also from Slovenia and from Spain. And uh, so the main aim of the project is really focused on transfer knowledge, uh, and this is part of uh, the steps we have uh, uh, to implement. So capacity building among us, uh, sharing experience, and also, let's say, set the, condition, uh, uh, the conditions for additional uh, APC investment in the future in, uh, in, uh, in each of the pilot regions uh, um, involved. I stop myself here. And uh, I give the floor to Lisa. Um, I would definitely start then. So in line with our former question and answer sessions, I'm going to kindly ask Daniele uh, to recap in five minutes or less uh, his video presentation. And then we will get through the proper, uh, set, the proper questions, starting from those uh, that we have gathered uh, before and in the past days. Uh, of course, partners, uh, I invite you again to, to, to be as much proactive as, possi as possible. Uh, and of course, if you need to ask a further question, please raise up your hand by clicking on the button uh, at the right side of your Zoom keyboard or simply jump in, unmute yourself and we will give you the floor. Um, so, uh, if, if everything is clear and fine, I kindly ask Daniele to start summing up the content of this presentation on measurement and verification procedures in relation to EPC contracts. Daniele, please, the floor is yours. Okay. Thanks again for the presentation, Lisa, and I would say at least that uh, the, the collaboration is reciprocal between uh, our two organizations, so and I think it's of interest for both of us. So I would just uh, jump in to a slide uh, that uh, uh, illustrate how you um, evaluate the uh, efficiency improvement uh, because uh, I mean energy savings as we usually call them uh, are the absence of uh, energy consumption so we are not able to directly measure them but we need some measurement and then some evaluation some <clears throat> calculation uh, to to evaluate them and so this is the scheme that uh, is uh, usually um, <clears throat> used to um, illustrate the way so we need uh, a baseline period so also known as a reference period and uh, we don't need just uh, the measurement of the uh, energy in case we are interested in energy or co2 emissions or so on but we also need some other kind of measurement of uh, other variables that the IPMVP called uh, independent variables. And so linking uh, uh, these, uh, trying to find uh, the links between uh, the energy consumption and those independent variables. Uh, and then we, <clears throat> we built a model of the 
baseline period that uh, allows us to evaluate the savings in the reporting period. So this is the typical approach in the, um, <clears throat> that is also called um, avoided uh, avoided uh, consumption avoided uh, avoided uh, avoided cost uh, in, in that, that answer to the the question which which would have be the cost or the consumption if i didn't have the energy efficiency improvement that is show here here ecm stands for energy conservation measure uh, energy conservation measure installation could be one or usually more than one measure installed at a, certain, at a certain moment after the baseline period. And then since there were already also, uh, there was also a question, I added this slide that was not present in my previous presentation. IPMVP to allow more flexibility has four options. So two of them are uh, isolation options. So you are concentrating your attention uh, you are focusing on uh, the uh, energy conservation measure uh, itself, if it's possible. In some cases, it is. Uh, typically, you use it uh, if you have just a lighting uh, update, uh, upgrade, or uh, you change uh, one motor, or you change uh, one boiler, or so on. Instead, uh, option C is a whole facility where you are looking at the, uh, all the results of the energy conservation, or usually more than one energy conservation measure on uh, a facility. A facility usually could be a building or a group of buildings inside the campus or so on. And uh, then there's option D that is a bit, apart, um, uh, stands, uh, it's a bit uh, uh, different option because it's a calibrated simulation. So you use a software simulation, typically a, a software similar to the one you use for the energy uh, performance uh, uh, of building uh, uh, evaluations for the energy performance certificate of building. Uh, and uh, then obviously you have to tweak a bit the coefficient uh, and the software variables uh, to adapt to the real consumption of that building, for instance, if you are using it for a building. So we have those <clears throat> four options to allow flexibilities. And uh, the two options of isolation, uh, option A is uh, uh, we are just focusing on the main, uh, the key parameters, and we are allowed to um, make some assumption. Uh, while option B, we measure all of the um, important parameters, then the, the parameters that are affecting uh, the, the energy consumption or the emissions. So this is just uh, to, to give you um, some of the obviously in my presentation, but it's all recorded, so it's meaningless that I go through uh, it again. Uh, just maybe I could uh, go back to the principles of IPMVP uh, and uh, there's a transparency, conservativeness, accuracy uh, that are very important ones. Also, the others obviously are important. I don't want to uh, go go back to all of them. And in the background, you see uh, the annex of the 2012-27 directive, uh, the energy efficiency directive, uh, that has a number of points uh, where transparency uh, appears. So that's very very relevant for the energy performance contracting, and it was one of the principles of the IPMVP since the beginning. And, uh, and then uh, the, the trade-off um, with the uh, accuracy and, uh, uh, sorry, the, I got, uh, conservativeness uh, gives you the right balance every, uh, ask you to find the right balance for every project uh, because uh, for the um, conservativeness, you should not uh, consider the uncertainty of the result. IPMVP requires you to evaluate the uncertainty in the results, so in the energy savings, and you should not take it in, into account. So you should subtract the uncertainty to the result. So uh, for this, uh, for so you uh, for every project you find the right balance of the cost versus accuracy. 
um, and but sorry, but this may be <laughs> this is may be very maybe difficult to grasp. Um, but eventually, uh, you can have a look uh, at some um, uh, at some Evo uh, guide on uh, on the topic because there are many and there are other to come. In the there's also a slide on this on uh, there's uh, um, the many guides that are coming out on uh, there's the new core concept the new IP MVP that is coming out uh, in uh, next weeks. And, uh, and the other that are supporting also for energy performance contract that is coming out next year. So there will be more to discuss or anyway, something to uh, to to watch on the, something, uh, other things to watch also on the EVO website. And there are other guys that are not here because I were already released that uh, could be very interesting. And uh, we will uh, talk about uh, answering to the question. So I think that now we can, I can stop sharing this screen and uh, maybe we can go to the questions. Yeah, thanks a lot, Daniela, uh, just for recalling these main topics uh, tackled in your video presentation. Um, yeah, let's start definitely uh, with the first round of question. Um, of course, uh, it's up to you, Dennis and Daniela, making the decision who answers to which question. Uh, we have tried to group uh, and aggregate the questions uh, uh, around some, some uh, main topics. So um, indeed the first uh, couple of questions deals with the cost effectiveness of uh, measurement and verification procedures and processes. And the first question is related to the uh, possible uh, presence of any uh, set percentage uh, related to um, measurement and verification costs. Uh, for example, in our case, a public authority should pay for, uh, given uh, the overall amount of an EPC contract and or its uh, foreseen uh, investment amount. And the second related question is uh, that, um, yeah, do you know, is there any kind of thresholds in terms of uh, uh, energy efficiency investments below which uh, uh, you think it doesn't make sense to implement uh, an MMB uh, procedure because of uh, its costs, maybe. Daniele, do you want to start? <laughs> Well, it's always it's always a bit tricky, also because uh, uh, it's always a bit tricky giving just uh, one number. There's a, a rule of thumb that is usually, uh, let's say, user that is uh, below ten percent of the savings, and uh, this below, I mean, those are the savings that you are expecting during the <coughs> contract. So you take that and you consider that uh, that that could be. Um, the sum of the the sum of the MMV expenses uh, all through the pro for the same period should be less than to, within let's say ten percent. That's uh, just a starting point. Then uh, you should really understand what are you uh, doing MMV on and what are I mean all all of the conditions. So it's just a first point. Uh, and obviously, uh, for very very small project, you can or very complex projects, it could be even higher. But usually, it's lower than it can be even lower, go down even maybe five percent or even lower. If our simple project may be a huge size, but quite simple, so it's uh, really you should understand. Mm, possibly with the first projects, you understand a bit better how much it cost it would cost also in uh, in your country considering the expertise available and the, the type of um, of premises where you are applying the mmb and doing the type of energy saving measures and so on so that's really i don't know dennis please <laughs> yes well as daniele said there is no single number that can be because there, there's more than numbers in that question um, I know that usually this is what people are interested in how much will it cost and how much should I invest in MNV but there are many many other considerations I'll just give you two uh, one of them is uh, is the investment also interested in energy transition CO2 reduction and things like that which 
in itself does not really directly relate to the monetary investment, but the outcome of it. So uh, you may have those considerations, or it could be air quality in a building, for example, for which it's very difficult to, to put a price tag on and say, well, I will not invest more than 10% because uh, I'm not concerned with air quality. If you are really interested in air quality, you may go much higher than 10%. And, uh, and Daniele said it in his presentation as well, it's a question of cost and accuracy as well. Uh, if you want to have something very, very accurate or more accurate or reduce the uncertainty, uh, you will have to invest more. So it's a, it's kind of a communication phase. You invest more, you reduce the uncertainty or you increase the accuracy. Uh, so this is another consideration. If you look at it from a purely financial operation, um, and from the ESCO perspective, uh, I guess most people will look at the internal rate of return of the investment as well. And uh, uh, but again, I mean, it says uh, some organizations are willing to go much higher than than others. Uh, some I know some ESCO, for example, that will not invest if the internal rate of return is uh, below 15%. Uh, last week, I was talking with uh, a huge investment fund, and they were interested in doing ESCO projects. And they said that they um, they were considering internal rate of returns below 10%, so which is much lower than most ESCOs are interested in. But they they had specific considerations uh, or goals to achieve and they were willing to to sacrifice th those returns for to attain those goals so it really depends um, on the on the objective um, maybe that took some notes uh, I guess that's it for now. I'm mean, just to generate the conversation. I don't want to spend too much time on that, but I mean, it, the short answer is that it depends on your goals. But uh, Daniele is right. Normally, it's below 10%. Maybe one thing I would add: if you have, and if you have a program, for example, uh, subsidizing small uh, investments, um, and this is most you see that in residential application. Um, I used to manage a program here in Canada for ground source heat pumps, and the average investment was, let's say, about 20,000 euros. Um, but to measure those systems, the cost of MNV was about $10,000 if you really wanted to do a, a, a very accurate measurement. So it was about 50% of the project cost was on MNV, very accurate MNV. And uh, we certified, I think it's 18,000 systems uh, over a 10 year period. And at some point we wanted to, to have an, a good idea of the impact of that pro program. And we decided to take a sample of those 18,000 systems. And we installed monitoring equipment and measuring equipment on, uh, I think it was about a hundred of them. So quite a huge sample. And we were able to more accurately define the benefits of those systems versus the, the theory. So it was a huge investment per project, but on the based on the population of 18,000 systems, we just selected a sample and then the MNV cost for the overall program was less than two or 3%, I think, of the overall program. So, but on a project, specific project, it was 50%. So it, it, it all depends how you look at the, uh, the numbers, but sampling when you have such a wide uh, program, uh, could be an option where you can spend more uh, on a project specific MNV and then do some uh, uh, averaging out for the uh, population. Uh, yeah, thanks, uh, Daniela and Dennis. Uh, I very much like the approach of considering uh, MNV like an investment on the accuracy and quality of the project in the end. So, uh, yeah, it, it's just a matter of uh, shifting the focus and uh, yeah, and the initial approach uh, over this process. Uh, moving to another uh, group of question um, regarding uh, uh, this time uh, role and responsibilities of uh, uh, MNV experts. Uh, the first question is uh, what is the role 
of MNV expert in case uh, the savings, uh, the planned savings are not achieved. And the second one is, uh, um, is concerning uh, um, the profile of uh, the MNV expert uh, and specifically should, should the uh, MNV expert be different from uh, an APC facilitator uh, and I'm talking about, uh, for example, energy agency. We, it is our in our daily work to assist uh, uh, public authorities with uh, uh, EPC schemes. Uh, or do you have any experience where those two profiles corresponded, possibly? Well, I, uh, I start. I start. Yeah. So. I... <laughs> Um, so on the on the first part, I, I would say that uh, I mean it depends if it's uh, the, the MMV expert is uh, internal to the, the provider, so the, maybe the ESCO or I mean the, the technology provider or a, a third party or internal to the client or so on. So you <clears throat> and the so it's really depend a bit on the on its role. So that is linked to the other question. Uh, and the one other point is that uh, uh, IPMVP uh, itself is um, has uh, some quality assurance uh, steps inside. So there's uh, operational verification before you start measuring uh, this, uh, the savings. Uh, this means that uh, um, you should start uh, check from the beginning that if the, the project is delivering or, or, or not. Uh, so if it's not able, and uh, you also evaluate in advance uh, as soon as it arrives to you, because maybe the MMV expert is only um, <clears throat> involved uh, at the second moment, not from the beginning, that could be the case. Uh, but um, you have anyway some kind of usually sensitivity and uh, evaluate if uh, that kind of uh, uh, efficiency measure on that kind of client, on that kind of uh, energy user and the profile and so on could guarantee that, that amount of savings. So you have some kind of uh, a priori check that you do, uh, a check that everything is working, can deliver savings. And then uh, it's your responsibility, obviously, to um, report the, the also the, the not achieved savings if they were not achieved. So um, those, the, then you will have to highlight what's not going, what, what is not going, and you may also support uh, to find uh, where, I mean, support the, the provider if you, if you are not directly involved with the provider, but maybe you can give from your experience or from your viewpoint that is external so you have may, may have a different viewpoint that could uh, also help the provider to understand what is not going in the in the right way um, so that's i i would say the, the role could support it could be uh, applying the ipmvps to give more um, quality assurance to the, <laughs> the results the savings that you are going to achieve in the in the project and uh, yeah you may support both client and uh, and provider and help them to understand what's not going and eventually to find another solution or another agreement uh, uh, if things are not are not going in the right direction so that could be also um, good in a way if you are uh, if you are uh, a facilitator I mean those those two figures if there's no conflict of interest those could i think from my point of view could be uh could well be the <clears throat> i mean an apc facilitator is also involved in the mmb if there's a, no conflict of interest but please then dennis thanks thanks daniele uh th this is another very interesting question that that is best answered almost with the with the matrix or a decision tree but um Again, I'm going to give a weird answer, but it, I would say it depends on the situation. And um, if you have a strict uh, relationship between an ESCO and a, uh, a facility owner, for example, where only two persons are involved, 
the well two person to two organizations usually the model is that the esco has the mnv expert and the um, facility facility manager or owner they don't necessarily have an mnv expert in-house so they trust basically the esco uh, the ideal situation is that any party involved in an ESCO project or EPC should have minimal knowledge of what MNV is. Uh, whether you are a super ESCO, whether you are a government organization, the ESCO obviously um, must have the, uh, the expertise, but the facility owner should have some expertise as well of MNV. And if financial institutions are involved, they should also have some basic knowledge. And the reason for that is that when you do a, a, an energy efficiency project that has IP MVP adherent or compliant, you work with an MNV plan. So this plan is done before the project is implemented. And parties involved must understand what's in that plan because this is the basically the, 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 um, the operational guidelines that parties will follow during the performance period of well before and after the implementation of the uh, the energy efficiency measure and this is the the guideline they will use for the uh, during the uh, implement the um, uh, performance period uh, so to go back to the other question is if savings are not achieved and parties involved in that contract don't understand what's going on well obviously one party will have more knowledge than another and so there might be an imbalance there. So long answer, <laughs> uh, parties should all be uh, uh, aware of what MNV is. Now, in terms of the level of expertise, um, in the case of an agency, for example, and I'll, you, you mentioned here the project facilitator, I'll use the example of um, the uh, Federal Energy Management Program in the US, the uh, FEMP program. Um, this is essentially a federal government program for federal buildings. And what they do is that they have in-house project facilitators who will work with uh, facility managers, uh, federal government, federally owned buildings in their ESCO projects. So you have the ESCO <clears throat> with experts in-house, and then you have the program designer, which is the US Department of Energy that have their own experts. And together, they work at designing the MNV plan. So this is probably the one of the most stringent program uh, that I've seen where a project facilitator have a major role to play uh, in, in a performance contract. Now we can take the example of a super ESCO. Super ESCO are normally, well, government agencies that are providing funds for projects. And, uh, but the each projects are done by different ESCOs. So they are basically giving you, it's like a financing institution, but owned by, by government usually. Uh, these organizations should have experts as well. So whenever there is an issue, uh, they can argue with the ESCO and uh, at the same level. Uh, if you are a, working in an organization where your role is simply to advise or provide some basic counsel. Uh, you may not need to be an expert in everything, but knowledge of MNV and the, the main uh, language of MNV, like the four options and uh, some basic notions of uncertainty and statistics. Uh, so so you, you may not need to have full expertise, but at least you have the knowledge of uh ipmvp and the the, the language of, of mnv and this is what we're trying at evo to achieve uh starting next year is having a level of education which is advisor or council level then an expert level where people know how to do an mnv plan and design an mnv plan its content and its operation and then we have another level which we call certified energy savings verifier which is really the top of uh, expertise and we're expecting these people to work for example for uh, for super escos or for big investment funds where they will review all the funding projects that are presented to them so that and that includes uh, reviewing investment grade audits and things like that so 
various level of expertise within or different organizations involved in the same projects. Uh, but uh, so the, the straight answer is that, uh, yes, the experts can be different and should be different uh, to make sure that everybody is, uh, is aware of what's going on. And that reduces the, uh, the potential for conflicts after a project is implemented because the, the savings may not be achieved for various reasons. And one obvious one in recent history is the COVID. Uh, when you empty the buildings and you don't consume energy, well, you're, not, you're saving, but it's not due to, uh, uh, to, to, to the, the energy efficiency measure that you, you've implemented. It's mainly due because there was nobody in a building. So if you don't know how to address those issues, well, uh, you don't know if your pro project performed or not, and you you may make adjust. You can make adjustments in your project or evaluation of MNV to, uh, to to take those uh, situations into considerations. But you need the expertise with dif at different level. Sorry for the long answer. No, no, no. It's uh, it's perfect. <laughs> Very detailed <laughs> and clear for myself. Uh, so thanks, Daniela and Dennis again. There's a question from uh, Remy. Um, I don't know, Remy, if you want to ask yourself uh, the question. Well, it's just uh, uh, regarding what uh, Dennis was saying now. Uh, when things are not uh, expected, and uh, then uh, is there a kind of mediation sometimes when you when things or everything is uh, processed uh, and you have you have to uh, go to one guy to to a, a point on um, well if you have experience on that and if you can tell a bit of the uh, well you're raising the point of the importance of the MNV plan uh, I mean there are like 14 or 15 chapters in the MNV plan. I'm not sure about the number because we're revising the IP MVP and it goes from 13, 14 and 15. But this is the place where these uh, considerations should be explicitly stated. Uh, for example, I know in, in, uh, in the Middle East, for example, in Dubai and places like that, the, in the ESCO contracts, I was told that there was no such thing as um, um, oh, what's the name? Uh, whenever there is an unforeseen event, uh, geez, <laughs> sorry, I have a blank. But uh, force majeure. Force majeure. There you go. So in 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 North American contract, you always have a force majeure clause. Uh, and uh, apparently in the Middle East, this is not really present. And I've heard the same in some other regions as well. So, but it's in the MNV plan that these things are, are uh, supposed to be dealt with in advance. So you have this clause in case of problem, we do this and that. Obviously, if there is nothing, well, then it may end up in courts uh, or it may end up in negotiations essentially between parties. And if they cannot agree, well, it, it may end up in court. Um, but uh, yeah, so I, there, there is no, uh, I'm not aware of any mediation process that exists uh, on a global basis or on a general basis. It's really contract by contract. Yeah, okay. in, in a way, in a way, if you have, uh, I mean, a third party, uh, if uh, the MMB expert is a, a third party, uh, so if the, this third party is um, as a credibility, the MMV expert could propose a solution because I mean, you can have something in mind when you are drafting the MMV plan, we are preparing the MMV plan, but then reality may exceed fantasy or your any kind of uh, scenario that you could have um, draft, I mean, put in the MMV plan. So. Um, then you you may have to introduce some changes and so on. So yeah, you the a, a third party expert could already provide some kind of solution that could fit both of the both of the parties. But that's so yeah, I I, I can see that. Uh, I mean, uh, it could fit in in this, but it, in any case, uh, any case could be different. Thank you. 
Thank you. I would stick to the topic of uh, unexpected uh, or unpredictable situations. And we do have another couple of questions on, on this topic. Uh, um, and Dennis just mentioned about COVID, uh, indeed. And one of these questions is about uh, the current situation, actually. So do you have any experience or reflection on, on how the COVID-19 and the spread out of smart working lockdown periods uh, affected the work uh, on the field of experts in their task of MNV? And as this increased the level of uh, discussion or uh, disagreement in the management of contracts, uh, second question on this topic is uh, how does the MNV approach uh, or method uh, adapt in case on, of unforeseen uh, circumstances? For example, if the purpose of functioning uh, of the building uh, changes for some reason during the PC period, for example, additional afternoon activities, and what kind of uh, backup does this require? an annex or maybe uh, uh, the initial contract has already foreseen some range uh, uh, in usage of the building. Um, I think Dennis uh, uh, just started uh, answering also these questions, but uh, please, uh, uh, the floor is yours, Dennis and Daniele. Maybe I, what I can offer is that, well, definitely the like COVID generated a, a lot of questions and uh, from our perspective, what's uh, what's interesting is that before, well, in, in 2019, we put together a group of experts. And uh, I don't know if it was <laughs> prescience or just pure chance, but uh, we, we put the, the, that group of experts to discuss exactly the COVID situation, like what happens when an unexpected event occurs and how can we adjust the, um, the the model or the contract to uh, to do proper measurement and verification and we came up with a guide uh, that we call non-routine event and non-routine adjustment it's it's quite technical but it's really provided uh, some recipe for mnv experts on how to uh, address uh, situations like covid um, i know that this guide was used quite broadly around the world by ESCOs and program manager and um, um, public institutions. One case I have in mind, and we published two articles on that in one of our magazines, it's in Ontario, it's a Canadian province. Uh, there is a program from the uh, one of the electricity uh, uh, market operator and they had this program where they provide subsidies according to the measured savings. So they pay annually an amount. So it's not an upfront payment. They pay annually and based on the savings. And then they were stuck saying, well, we cannot measure anymore because there, there's either nobody in the building or there are twice more people than before. And so they used our guide and uh, some of the uh, formulas in there to adjust the measurement and they are they have based their payments on the uh, revised MNV uh, savings estimation using those guides so there's the, that case that I know of because they published articles but I know in the US that many ESCOs and other programs like Bonneville Power Administration the Seattle the city of Seattle use that as well for their program so there are ways to adjust for unforeseen events and we provided I hope most of the uh, possibilities or ways to uh, circumvent those uh, those problems and Dennis uh, is is that guide public and can can we share Yes, it's, you? Can it's you, available can you send on our link then. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's available on our website. Uh, okay. People just need to register for a free account okay. and then you, you can access the guide. But I can, yeah, I cannot send you the direct link, but I can send you, <laughs> okay. I'll send you a copy of the, uh, the document. Yeah. Uh, Thanks, it's, Emilio. it's just yeah. that we like, we like you people cannot, to Dennis. Remember, you cannot. <laughs> no, I can't. Well, yeah, we, we usually collect the, the contact information for the, the people who download our guides so that's why we direct them to the uh, the free account creation but uh if you cannot find it just send me an email i'll forward okay. it I got okay it. <laughs> okay yeah, I, I would like just to add yeah. that i mean after the lockdown that we had 
now, I mean, we, we cannot see, say anymore that it, it, it is an unforeseen event. It, it would have been two years ago, but from now on, on the new contracts, in the, the new MMV plans, you should uh, face something like what happened at the, in, at the end of 2019, 2020. So, I mean, you, you, you should find, uh, collect more data and then uh, put more some additional clauses in the contract, uh, some more explanation in the uh, MMV plan and so on. So, I mean, all, all, of, all, all of the, um, the MMV experts and the providers, I mean, they grow up also with this very single, let's say singular situation, but that, uh, so, so now, I mean, I, I expect to find something in the contrary. I see Silvio's rising a big yellow hand. Please, Silvio. Oh, yes. Uh, I was wondering if a uh, kind of close could be that uh, in case of uh, uh, prolonged lockdown periods or, or uh, I don't know, I mean, uh, the, the, the uh, the monitoring and verification procedure does not apply for that year, let's say. Could it, could it be a, a kind of, uh, yeah, suspension clause, let's say, that, that uh, comes into force when the number of days or hours, I don't know, is, is, too, is too much. It makes not very um, feasible the measurement or... or could it be? Yeah, I've, I've heard that, uh, well, the question is quite legitimate, and despite the MNV plan and despite the possibility of making uh, non-routine adjustments, uh, in some cases, when COVID occurred and uh, based on, on the project specifics, because no two projects are alike, but uh, I'm aware of uh, ESCO contracts that were suspended uh, by both parties for a year, six months, or two years. I don't know the exact time, but they, they basically agreed that instead of getting into a, uh, a conflict, that they would essentially suspend the uh, the contract uh, for the duration of the lockdown or uh, particularly when it was a government uh, order uh, that both parties could not do anything again so that that was the uh, the agreement they came with uh, but again it's project specific but i've seen that in, in, in some situations yeah Thanks again. Um, yeah, and maybe if yeah. I can complement, yeah. just, uh, in a, another op option is the structural change, let's say, that we might see in, in, in the in companies. I mean, uh, with the spread out of, uh, of smart working as a real, a, a ordinary practice and not in any more extraordinary measure. I mean, also this is uh, is something that uh, might uh, affect uh, this because uh, maybe in the future, but we don't know exactly. But maybe in the future, less and less uh, people will go in the office working, or we, they will go differently. So it's even an additional, let's say, uh, variable that's really a bit tricky to do. To understand. I mean, for, for school, for example, I, I mean, this is more stable, more uh, understandable, but maybe for offices, large companies are, are applying a different way of um, organizing the labor factor. Yeah, I, I would uh, add to this, uh, sorry, Dennis, uh, just because I think that there's, uh, I mean, the, the technical part, it is even interesting to try to see what was the savings, what was the lower energy consumption due to uh, lower uh, occupancy, lower uh, uh, opening times and so on. So that there are, you, you could do that, but it can eventually arrive to nothing because at the end, uh, you, maybe the savings are very slow. So, it, and I mean, if you apply the formula in the, in the contract, um, this is not going to repay the investment uh, of, the, of the ESCO. So, uh, from from the technical part of the MMV, you you may be able to do it, but then you should see if the contract is sustainable or or not. So that's uh, totally another another aspect that uh, I mean the, the two parties should uh, 
uh, in some way find find the find the solution that is uh, yeah that could be suspending the contract or changing changing the way uh, the, the remuneration of the the party who did uh, the investment or or something like that because I mean at the end uh, <clears throat> someone made the investment uh, and I think um, you should find a, you should find a way to recognize it uh, but th that's not much uh, connected to to just to the MMV I would say but please Dennis. Yeah. Well, the, the, there are different situations that I'm thinking of. Uh, in, in some performance contract, for example, in the MNV plan, it's already stated that we will do a measurement for two years, although the contract is good for 10 years. And then they will assume that, that this, once they measure the savings for two years, they assume that the savings will uh, exist for another eight years. So if COVID occurs in year number three, well, tough luck. I mean, if uh, you're going to have to pay because you agreed in advance to pay uh, and not do a further MNV. Uh, but it could go both ways. Uh, if you have a school, for example, uh, well, not a school, if you have a hotel and you're reducing significantly your energy consumption, uh, you may have to pay the ESCO. But again, if you're saving a hundred thousand euro, and the contract says that you're you have to pay the ESCO fifty thousand euro, well, you're still fifty thousand euros better off despite the lockdown. Uh, in hospitals or healthcare uh, buildings, you probably have more energy expenses than before. Uh, so it depends how the contract is worded uh, because you have more people, you open the windows for uh, aerations and things like that. So it's really building specific and contract specific as well. And um, this is one of the reasons why, but personally I'm not too keen with contracts that says, well, we'll measure for a couple of years and then assume that the saving exists. Uh, because at the end of the day, you may create uh, unhappy people, but then they decided to be unhappy by signing a contract. So it's, it's their own decision initially. So it's it's dangerous to uh, to assume that the savings will in, will exist after initial measurement because you don't know what will happen in a building. Uh, if it's only three or four years uh, performance uh, period, that's fine. But if you have more than that, it's uh, it's a bit risky. I don't know if I answered the question, but <laughs> probably made more comments. Than, yeah. I think so. Uh, there is, uh, uh, there is uh, a consideration uh, uh, by Laurent. I don't know if you want to share it, Laurent. Yes, uh, yes yeah? but today my connection is not so, so good. <laughs> but uh, yes, uh, right. the, the National uh, Observatory of uh, um, EPC in France I've made a study uh, about this uh, COVID <coughs> crisis, and uh, it appears that uh, only um, one third of the uh, EPC contract in France have signed uh, Avenant uh, to their contract. Most of them just discuss and uh, made a suspend, uh, uh, why on suspendu, <laughs> uh, suspend the, uh, the penalties for one year. So, but uh, I, I just want to add that um, in France, uh, EPC are not only commercial uh, contracts, it's, all, all, it's always partnership contracts. And this partnership is very important in this case because it's a win-win uh, solution uh, you have to find. And it's not only a legal solution or commercial solution, it's a win-win discussion. You're, okay, you're probably talking about shared saving schemes or contracts. Is that the case in France? Excuse me? You, you are mentioning a shared savings contract? Uh, no, 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 no. Um, no, it's, it's real EPC with uh, penalties uh, in case okay. of uh, over con over consumption and uh, uh, um, yes, bonus if you uh, are in, uh, yeah, under consumption. Yeah, uh, minus bonus. Okay, yeah. Okay. Okay. Would uh, I would uh, stick to the end user behavior that we some of us just mentioned, 
Uh, Silvio mentioned schools, for example, and uh, indeed, uh, do you have any concrete example on how to manage uh, the end user behaviors in public building while performing the MMV procedure? Uh, in Italy, we don't have, for example, mechanical ventilation in schools. Uh, the users open windows manually as just they feel like. Uh, and nowadays with COVID again, teachers tend to keep the windows open more than in the past. Uh, how to deal with it? Do you have any special recipe for that? Uh... <laughs> Daniele, you're you're the M and V instructor. <laughs> no, 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 it's it's okay. No, I think I think I don't uh, have uh, any any example on this, but yeah. just uh, a consideration. So usually, when you do the M and V, you are able to give uh, uh, feedbacks. Um, the, it also depends on the frequency of the M and V and the reporting. But uh, M and V is a, in a, an energy management uh, system. Uh, allows you to give uh, periodical feedbacks to the people. And I think this is very useful in the behavioral change um, programs and uh, anyway, in a good uh, uh, energy management of, of the structure. So if you're able to give feedback to the person uh, and possibly not just the feedback itself, but presenting um, in the right way, uh, involving the people, uh, doing some um, kind of um, yeah, explain why it's important to do uh, to have this kind of behavior. What are the advantages for the <clears throat> for the organization? For I mean, uh, the multiple benefit of energy efficiency uh, and so on. Uh, that that would surely be helpful. Then, if we go look at the the question on the other on the other way, because I'm not sure if. Um, is also as a more let's say the the, the the approach where you you want to to check the the savings that would be uh, typically an an option c approach so you consider the whole building and uh, you don't really uh, usually have the possibility to uh, evaluate just to be ever change um, program alone but you uh, evaluate uh, all of the savings of the building together uh, eventually then if there are few other energy conservation measures you can isolate the other measures and doing some kind of differences you, you could find the, the i mean the result of the of the behavioral change but that, that would be very complex and just uh, <clears throat> doable uh, just doable in in specific cases but anyway, um, I think the MMV could again be uh, be very uh, very good for MMV or a, an, a, an energy management system in place could be very good to strengthen uh, the behavioral changes to give uh, I mean, <clears throat> positive feedbacks to those who are applying for <clears throat> yeah, and reinforce uh, reinforcing feedback. Uh, for the people involved. Yeah. <clears throat> Maybe just a few additional comments on that. MNV in itself does not exist if there is no energy efficiency project. So, and uh, normally energy efficiency projects should not exist outside of an energy management system in a building. Uh, <clears throat> it because it's 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 a kind it's the it's a logical reasoning normally you implement an energy efficiency projects because you because you did an analysis of your energy consumption and as part of the solutions uh, the energy management system will address those issues of opening windows and uh, uh, um, uh, users' behaviors, and then you implement the energy efficiency measures. And behavior could be an energy efficiency measure as well, by the way. Uh, and, and then you get to MNV. So there is this sequence, this logical sequence of event that drives you to MNV, but at the very top. It's uh, it, it should there should be an energy management system. It doesn't have to be complex, but there should be something uh, to start with. Uh, or or you're just interested in changing your your lighting and that's it, <laughs> and then 
regardless of the, of the cost, but normally it's it's more uh, it's a little bit more uh, elaborate than that. So, uh, but that's the place to address those issues. It's at the uh, yes, uh, energy management system design. Okay, thanks again. Any any comment or uh, or further question details on this issue? Otherwise, I will move to one of the next uh, topic. Uh, um, Daniele just mentioned about the options foreseen by the IPMPP protocol, and so I will move to just to to this uh, issue and topic. Uh, we do have a couple of questions in relation to the reference framework. And the first question asks, uh, the IPMVP protocol revolves around different options, uh, just the ones uh, that Daniele um, shared before. Um, could you quickly explain the key elements of each one and in what case it is preferable to select them, possible with concrete example? What do you think about the hybrid option between options C and D regarding the case when uh, there is not enough data to set the reference situation? Second question is, do you have uh, any experience recommendation on how uh, precisely the frameworks of reference use need to be prepared? For example, uh, the case of uh, sports hall with complete energy refurbishment of the building. Is it enough uh, if they are set as reference frames of the total hours of use on a weekly or monthly basis? or probably it makes sense to set the reference use at different time of the day? So I try to, uh, so I uh, already okay. uh, used the, that um, option selection uh, flow chart. Um, so um, the different option A, option A typically is, uh, is an option when you have a simple energy conservation uh, conservation measure like lighting on off lighting so you just uh, change the efficiency or maybe uh, or yeah this is, or you have a, a low budget because you have a low saving so you you need to to lower the the cost uh, option b is typically when you are just interested in the efficiency of one energy conservation measure so maybe uh, the single one like changing the boiler so you just want to understand the efficiency of the boiler uh, during the operation so you measure before uh, the, the, the energy entering the boiler and the energy getting out of the boiler so the gas the, the fuel coming into the boiler and uh, the hot water steam or so on getting out of the boiler option c is when you uh, concentrate on the whole building so you just you typically use just uh, the data of the utility meters so electricity and usually natural gas meters and then according also to energy conservation measures that are uh, of interest uh, for the MMV plan while option D is typically where you have missing data or a very complex situation so where um, and then this is linked also to, to the question. So um, when you have missing data, you do option D and then you calibrate the simulation when with the data that you have. So typically the post retrofit data, or you have a number of adjustment to do because maybe, I mean, like the lockdown or uh, changing in the use of, uh, of the building or so on. So, there are so many changes that you need to run a simulation to do. I mean, since the, all of the, uh, I mean, the, the the building and the system are interacting quite a lot, so it's quite difficult to to make adjustment uh, without uh, a software simulation. If there are many many. Sorry, I touched it involuntarily, but I, I thought you, you were listening to me before this. Um, so uh, I think that's... Um, uh, then there's... Yeah, you can also uh, use the simulation just to do these kind of changes. I think in this way it could be, uh, let's say, called hybrid option, 
or you can start with an option uh, with a calibrated simulation and then switch uh, to option C uh, because this also has some positive aspect because it seems more real because you are based then I mean you are going to to do the reporting based on real data that you are getting from the utility meters so there, there could be advantages uh, on this but obviously if then you need to do some other adjustment you need to switch again to the option D so to the simulation so it could be interesting or not depends uh, regarding the second question, uh, it's really very difficult to answer because uh, as I started uh, with, the, you may remember that sc the scheme for evaluating the saving, I say that you, you should find some links between the energy consumption and the, the variables that are um, affecting the energy consumption. So those links could be very clear and very strong or you may need to use many many variables or at the end you could not find those links and you find other kinds of <clears throat> of approaches or you do a simulation so it, it really depends can case by case and eventually also the situation before the retrofit and after the retrofit could be different for instance if you have a, a very uh, a, a very <laughs> average building before and then you do a high quality uh, refurbishment after so it becomes old, uh, a near zero uh, energy building then it could be a bit tricky after because you were you could uh, if you are doing a modeling after then i mean the maybe the, the daily the daily uh, degree days are not affecting so much because your building is very very well insulated there is energy recovery and so on so um, it also can be let's say in a way tricky to to do a model in that situation but if you had had made a good model before then uh, you can uh, use it to evaluate the savings so it, it's just to say that uh, uh, case by case you should find those links uh, and uh, in, the, in this question also um, re there's a reference of this uh, uh, kind of uh, um, other weekly models so you can use uh, uh, because there are some buildings where it changes a lot uh, the users of the building and so even eventually the, the usually the consumption uh, with the, with the use and you have, may have a very different use during the week and during the weekend so you can do two models one for the weekdays one model for the weekend or you can do this uh, uh, hourly model for uh, for each day of the week uh, and then so you show you are modeling let's say hourly day by day uh, for different days of the weeks are different approaches that you should check uh, with the real data and see if uh, what is working and what is not working uh, because sometimes it's tricky and sometimes uh, it's difficult really to find uh, those those links or the, the, the links are not so strong so um, in case case by case you should find uh, you should really find and the sports facility could be very tricky um, and uh, you should find uh, I mean, those variables that are affecting the consumption. Usually the number of people is affecting the consumption because of the number of showers or, um, I mean, the, but, but depends facility by facility and it is not easy to, to really find, uh, to, to really say beforehand what, what could be a good approach. So you, you should try more than one possible, probably. Thanks, Daniela. I don't know if Dennis wants to add anything. Otherwise, uh, and partners as well, if, if do you have any comments uh, or question, please raise your hand. Otherwise, uh, we we are uh, we are nearly there. I would say um, we do have uh, just a couple of questions left. Um, some concerns 
the, the benefits uh, uh, which uh, MNV procedure can trigger. Um, the first indeed is that in your video slides, uh, it is reported uh, uh, among the benefits of an accurate uh, MNV process that uh, uh, measured savings can be valued and potentially uh, traded. Uh, do you possibly mean that uh, thanks to those uh, certified savings, also in terms of carbon savings, of course, uh, for example, public authorities uh, uh, who are our target in the project then could potentially uh, be engaged, for example, in the voluntary carbon offset market? And there is a question related to um, carbon savings uh, and the way they are uh, calculated. Um, in particular, and in detail, the question is, uh, carbon savings is just a calculation consumption savings uh, uh, multiplied by the emission factor of a given energy vector, or uh, um, it is uh, estimated in another way. And does the emission factor, uh, the second question is, depends uh, uh, on the country, uh, which I strongly believe uh, it is the case, but the floor is yours, uh, Daniel and Dennis. I, I would leave to Dennis on, on the part on the trade, I think. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because it was my comment and your slides, so it's... <laughs> <laughs> we, we share the slide. Uh, I, I guess the answer about the um, the voluntary carbon market, the answer is yes. Uh, the uh, because and I have a practical case in mind. So uh, there are essentially two types of schemes, like the regulatory schemes and the the voluntary car carbon reduction market. Uh, but both can rely on MNV. I mean, essentially the IPMVP provides a framework to calculate energy savings. And then you, whoever asked the question rightfully, uh, it's just a question of applying the right factors to those savings to get the, uh, the reduction. The, the big question is, are the savings that are estimated uh, credible or not? And to what extent, uh, and, and then it goes back to the question of how much accuracy are you seeking uh, when you calculate those savings? And is this level of accuracy enough to, to respond to the regulatory requirements of a government or a, an authority? So then it's a question of who designs what and what they want in terms of, uh, of, uh, of savings. Generally speaking, what I've seen, though, when it was public agencies is that the, the savings or the carbon reductions were not, uh, they were withdrawn from the market, essentially, like the federal government in Canada, whenever they subsidize a, a project, they claim the savings and the GHG reduction, but they do not trade them, they just retire them from the market. So they are, they are not traded. It's probably different in other places in the world, but um, in terms of business to business or private sector to private sector, I have a case in mind actually. Yeah, we're negotiating with them to see how to do that. But uh, essentially we have commercial buildings uh, in the US uh, and in Canada, like hotels, for example. Uh, so they do an energy efficiency projects and not necessarily done with an ESCO uh, and they are interested in putting some value on their efforts uh, to, uh, to reduce uh, their emissions or carb yeah, carbon emissions. So, and they, so they were not subsidized by any utility, any government, no ESCO involved. And they said, well, we've been good citizens. <laughs> we made an effort to reduce our footprint and how, can, can it be valued? And what we found is that big corporations like Microsoft, Google, uh, the big ones are interested in buying those credits uh, from those people on a business to business uh, deal. And these credits are retired from the market. They expire uh, after a while. So five years, six years, seven years. What, what we see at the moment is that the, um, those carbon reduction or offsets are traded at, uh, at a relatively big discount from uh, regulated schemes. 
Uh, for example, if, uh, if the ton of CO2 is uh, 50 euros, uh, these private deals could be 25 euros or 20 or 50. Uh, so a big discount from, from the regulated schemes. But still, it, it is a good example of people willing to engage into a market, a carbon, a carbon offset market uh, on a private basis. So it's quite interesting. We're, and we're using, probably going to use the IPM VP. Uh, and the question now is what's the level of uncertainty or the level of accuracy that, we, that those parties are looking for? And of course, we don't want to reduce the relevancy of the IPMVP. So we're very careful as to what we accept in terms of uh, people referring to IPMVP. But at the same time, the protocol is public, it's free, anybody can use it the way they want. Uh, it's just at the end of the day, the question, will Evo validate those savings? Uh, we're not sure yet. So it depends how stringent they want to be, but definitely there is uh, this, this market that is emerging, uh, or at least there is a desire to, to have it emerge in, in some places. So uh, for the second question, you, you're right. I mean, the, the carbon, I mean, it's really a country by country basis. Uh, or it could be regionally as well. It depends on the electricity market structure. Uh, for Italy, for example, I think the um, the reduction, the uh, uh, the carbon intensity of electricity production is about 0.34 kilograms of CO2 equivalent per kilowatt hour. Uh, in Norway, it's 0 0.01. In France, it's 0. 14, I think, and and it mostly reflects like Norway, of course, big hydropower, France, nuclear, so less CO2 emissions. Uh, in Canada, I think we are at uh, 0. 0.14 or 20, uh, no, 34. Uh, but in Quebec, it's probably 0. 0.001 because we only have hydro for electricity production. In other provinces, <coughs> provinces they have coal. So it really depends. So it's uh, within a service area of a public utilities or electric utility, that's where the carbon uh, emission uh, um, factors should be used to calculate savings or CO2 savings. Yeah, <clears throat> I would just like to add uh, one thing that uh, um, is, yeah, <clears throat> one concern, let's say, uh, about uh, just uh, considering CO2 uh, reduction, because uh, since there are those coefficients in the middle, and those coefficients could vary year by year, uh, or eventually also if you are purchasing uh, green, uh, uh, green electricity or not, uh, and so on. So you, I, it depends what's the use of it, but if you, um, because there were um, proposals in the past of making contracts, uh, energy efficiency contracts, but then based on CO2, uh, on emission savings, uh, I think that is better to present both of the, of the, of the calculation, one for the energy uh, the reduction in energy consumption and the other for the reduction of the CO2 because otherwise uh, it's, it's there's the risk that uh, you could uh, play a bit with the coefficient and uh, or at least uh, you there's uh, some change in the national coefficient or regional coefficient or so on and you don't see the saving or you are amplified the saving so it's just something that I, I think you should bear in mind because it's very good to to look at this CO2 um, emission reduction, but you should uh, <laughs> be be sure there's no no way to to add some uh, gray gray area or where you can play a bit uh, and maybe the the customer or the client is not really uh, able to check or or could check. So I I guess you you should have bot bot numbers, ask for bot numbers. Okay. I agree with I agree with Daniele, and uh, I think it's part of the uh, transparency uh, aspect that uh, he mentioned in his presentation earlier. Um, 
and he's right that the uh, the factors can change from from year to year. So it's uh, definitely having the energy savings and transparently what are the factors on a yearly basis. Uh, and even when it looks obvious that, uh, for example, natural gas, we can say, well, the factor is so much uh, CO2 emission per cubic meter. Well, it depends. I mean, is there any um, biofuel or biogas in your natural gas, distribu distributed natural gas, and so on and so on? So transparency requires that you qualify those factors in, in your calculations or in your claims for, for reduction. If you don't do that, it's a, I mean, the, the energy savings can be accurate, but the CO2 emissions can go all over the place. So transparency would require to put indeed those two columns and <laughs> well three columns factor and results on a yearly basis yeah very clear fully agree uh, and thanks again um comments or questions otherwise otherwise there is the very last uh, but not least uh, question then by my side So I will start with it. Uh, does Evo provide upon request a list of uh, MNB experienced professional at European country level? Uh, also, um, especially public authorities can turn to for assistance uh, with MNB processes. Denis, I think it's for you. Oh. Oh, I think then is that an issue? Oh, oh. Frozen. Oh, okay. Wow. Too, too cold in Canada. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I, I I will answer. Uh, I, <clears throat> I think uh, I mean f there's a, a di directory um, online directory with the with the names of all the um, the people who who did this uh, the training and. Um, the certification and then as uh, Dennis said now there are different levels of certification but is a, a person this is just starting now uh, so you could find uh, those names and there's a, a filter by by country so you, you can find them for Italy I'm trying to do a bit more because I'm <clears throat> let's say I, I, I trained uh, all of them so I am trying also to if it's needed to give some subdivision province by province so you can have some local local one that or <clears throat> if you ask me I, I could try to provide some names uh, at local level um, so that's that's it but I I guess most of the Evo training providers could could do something like that if you get in touch with them I, I don't guarantee but it's something that they may be able to do and uh, so that's <clears throat> that's it i'm sorry that we lost for um the, we lost dennis that was yeah, supposed to give this it, this answer uh, <laughs> so maybe you would have had other, other things that I'm, that I'm not aware of so i'm sorry no problem uh, okay. i was hoping uh, he, he was able to join us again but uh, of course uh, uh, this happens from time to time. Um, so um, I would Maybe definitely, I can, yeah, of course, Silvio, you are welcome. I can point yeah. uh, another question. I yeah. think, uh, Daniela can uh, can answer properly. I mean, the, the question uh, uh, is related to uncertainty. And um, I mean, I think that you, you have several kinds of uncertainties that uh, sum up together or mix up together. And uh, when it comes to energy savings, uh, which is about, I don't know, it could be 30% or 40%, uh, maybe plus or minus uh, 10 uh, of uncertainty because of the measurement, because of the calculation, estimation, and so on. So it makes uh, quite a big difference. Uh, am I wrong or, or is, is uh, yeah, I don't know if you can just. No, the, the point is um, that every project is different. So um, then you don't, usually the, the main part of uncertainty come from the modeling. 
because uh, usually the the measure the, the the measurement instrument has uncertainty that is uh, around uh, one percent or lower than one percent or a bit higher than one percent but i mean few percent is the measurement answer the, the measurement uncertainty usually then there is the model uncertainty that could be much much higher because uh, i mean the model uh, you may not find uh, the right variables so the variables are explaining just part of the um, changes in energy consumption or so on so the the point is that uh, uh, sometimes uh, we are used to uh, to find um, yeah to take the, the the data from the, the the measurement instrument without considering the uncertainty because that's usually what we do when we are when we are paying our energy bills no one is uh, asking but what's the uncertainty of the of the meter because also because the uncertainty of the of the meter for the mid directive is limited so it's a, there's a limited uncertainty and the mid all, all of the process uh, behind the <clears throat> the quality assurance behind the mid mid directive measurement instrument directive ensure that uh, this uncertainty is kept low for the whole let's say duration of the meters then there is the again the the uncertainty of the model or there could be also the uncertainty of the sampling as uh, Dennis uh, mentioned the sampling before that could be also there could be also sampling uncertainty or there could be some assumption if you typically if you put uh, use an option a there are assumptions so there's 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 uh, there's an uncertainty from there so you should um, con consider it because uh, you mute yourself Daniela yes sorry I'm just uh, sometimes I touch the computer and the for <laughs> um I play too much with my fingers so um, on, on my uh, trackpad anyway so uh if it's nice not to consider it because you have much higher savings but part of the savings are not certain are just uh, savings that you see there because you don't consider all of the uncertainty typically in the model typically from the modeling so uh ipmvp requires you to consider it so you usually are going to strengthen your modeling so that's why you are IPMVP asks you to to do it, or eventually uh, that uh, you you don't consider a part of the savings because that's the other possibility. Sometimes you cannot. Uh, it too it is too costly to make a better model, or <clears throat> doesn't make sense to be, to make a better model. So in that case, you should decide that uh, you you lose a part of the savings. Uh, maybe the savings are there, but you you don't know if they are those are really savings or not because it's there's an there's an uncertainty so that's that's a bit of the point every every project by project you should find uh, the threshold but uh, uh, i also say in my presentation i mean in the previous webinar that now we have more interesting approaches so for instance now i, I think I, in italy for most of the meters are now smart meters so also for gas meters you can have uh, daily data and this improves a lot the modeling um, <clears throat> so you can have much better models of at least of the uh, reporting period and with the back back casting approach you do the model of the reporting period and then you compare to the baseline period so and that could be very interesting and i would like also if you have the possibility to do some <clears throat> some evaluation with your data uh, that could be interesting that would be some field study to do with this and because i i think it's, this is a very interesting options that uh, has also been applied in some big contract in europe by the way this start this this backcasting approach uh is an example that is coming from europe uh, in the ipmvp so that's uh, something that um <clears throat> that could be interesting for for you to try to to apply and see if it gives 
interest, some good result, and uh, lower in the uncertainty, and so uh, <laughs> having higher savings. That that could be something that that you could try. Okay, <clears throat> I don't know if uh, I answered you, Silvi, or not. Otherwise, we could <laughs> uh, maybe continue or <clears throat> eventually privately or in. in a... <laughs> okay. Great. Welcome back, <laughs> Dennis. In the meantime. <laughs> ah, okay. So, sorry, there's a yeah, freezing no freezing rain yeah. outside, and it's. Uh... <laughs> I mean, the wires are going like this, and I lost the yeah, connection. Yeah, 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 uh, yeah. The, yeah. The call was reflected in the connection. Yeah. <laughs> so, any other comment or questions? Otherwise, given the time, I would close the session in a few minutes. But there's a bit of room for for other questions or comment quickly. Um, okay, so. Otherwise, uh, um, I, I thought I think this this conversation was uh, really interesting, uh, useful, and uh, inspiring, at least by my side. Um, with the today's session, our stepping plus training sessions uh, on EPC contracts, uh, as said uh, by Silvio, are over. Uh, in the next days, partners will have also the recording uh, of the session available further to the slide and the video presentation by Daniela, already posted uh, uh, on the website, on the project website and on our sh shared folder. Uh, thanks a million again, uh, sincerely, to our uh, guests, to Dennis and Daniela, despite their holiday, despite the different uh, time zone. Uh, and thanks uh, again, really, for the valuable time and the valuable expertise uh, shared today. Um, so thanks to, to all partners also for their participation. Uh, and of course, uh, given the time of the year, uh, I want to wish you all a Merry Christmas and a fabulous 2022. Thank you. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you for everything. Bye. 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 Bye